Thanks, Anna. The floor is yours, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a too presumptuous title, but what the heck. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this is a, a joint work with my students, Itai, Owen, and, and Asaf. And I thought I would begin with some uh, um, short history of autonomous vehicles as I experienced it. Um, so when you look at vehicles, the first uh, picture of a vehicle that I'm aware of is this uh, Benz Patton motor wagon from 1885. Um, but when you look for the first accident, uh, it actually appeared before the first uh, internal combustion engine uh, vehicle appeared. Uh, it happened in 1869. Uh, there was a steam car fatality. Um, Mary Ward was driving, was riding with uh, her cousins and they took a, a turn and she, he was driving too fast, she fell off the wagon and the wheels hit her and she died instantly. Um, and so there is a lot of discussions today about how to make uh, autonomous vehicles safe, um, but they had similar discussions back in the day. And so there is something known as the red flag traffic laws that was uh, enacted in law in, in the United Kingdom back in 1865. And one of the rules there stated that uh, there should be a man walking with a red flag at least 60 yards ahead of each vehicle to warn pedestrians from the coming vehicle. And if you fast forward to 1896, in Pennsylvania, there was a law that stated that upon a chance encounter with cattle or livestock, uh, the owner of the vehicle must immediately stop the vehicle uh, as rapidly as possible, disassemble it, and conceal it until the livestock is uh, sufficiently pacified. Um, luckily, the governor of the state, Daniel Hastings, vetoed the, the decision. Uh, so we have vehicles today uh, in part thanks to him. Um, and yet here we are today, it's uh, 2020, and according to the latest uh, World uh, Resource Institute, we have more than 1 million uh, fatalities, automobile fatalities per year. Uh, Europe is apparently the safest region in the world with uh, about less than nine people per 100,000, uh, less than 10 deaths per 100,000 people. Um, Americas is in around 15 and Africa is at the top with about 26. And I always wonder, um, there was never a panel that looked at the data and said, well, we're going to suffer 1 million casualties, but we're going to allow it because we want all the advantages of vehicles. And I wonder how this autonomous vehicle uh, uh, will play out uh, in the future. We have like a decision that this is the number of fatalities that we're willing to suffer or not. And I think it's an open and important question, but I don't know how it will play out. Okay. So uh, let's talk about autonomous vehicles. And I think one of the themes that I saw emerging in the uh, presentations throughout this week is how do we approach this problem? So one approach is to say, well, you have an input output problem. You have a video on uh, the bottom left and you have the steering wheel and the pedals at the top right. And you build a large system that basically for every possible input produces the, the relevant output. Um, and the alternative is to say, no, I'm going to break it into boxes and I'm going to work on each box separately. So I have a sensing box and a detection and the tracking and probably driving policy and eventually a control to, to get the, the thing done. Um, and a lot of people uh, presented this week and discussed these issues. I just wanted to add my piece uh, uh, to the to this conversation, this is something that we encountered early on, and this is a work we did 20 years ago. Uh, we had the same type of problem. So at the time I was working for Mobileye, and we had two teams, one working on tracking, the other one was working on, on vehicle detection. And the goal that I was uh, uh, tasked with is the ability to detect, to, to track this uh, vehicle over here. And I kept improving the algorithm and making it as, as good as I, as I can, but then it hit me that the question is, what is the goal of the tracker? 
Uh, so do you want to make the tracker the best there is, or is there a higher level goal? And the conclusion that uh, I came up with is that you don't want to do tracking for the sake of tracking. What you want to do is to be able to do tracking in order to detect the vehicles in the uh, subsequent frame, frames. So in, in, in the time, at the time, the way you, do, you did the vehicle classification was using a support vector machines. And so I designed a tracker that instead of minimizing some of the differences uh, between consecutive frames, try to maximize the SBN score. So the goal was to break the barrier between tracking and detection and make a single unified framework that deals with the, this part of the uh, stack. And this is the, the result. This is 20 years old, uh, I think now. Uh, so the idea is that the tracker here is not interested in matching pixels from frame to frame, but rather finding and detecting the, the highest probable region in the image. Which brings me to the topic that I want to, go, uh, to, to discuss today, which is a point cloud and sampling point clouds. So there is a lot of work in, in recent years on 3D point clouds, and this is going to be the topic of my uh, talk. Uh, and I just threw a bunch of uh, examples here. You use uh, point clouds to represent indoor scenes, and you use point clouds to represent outdoor scenes. And in the context of uh, autonomous vehicles, you use LIDAR. So a LIDAR will give you a point cloud of the scene, and with the advent in the quality of LIDARs, you get a higher and higher quality LIDARs, and you often want to sample them. And so if you read the papers and the deal with point clouds, they would often sample the point cloud in order to allow efficient uh, computation and handling of the, of the process at hand. And so just like in the tracking case, the question is, what is the goal of sampling? Okay. Um, so, that leads me, this is the, essentially the most important slide of the uh, talk. Uh, you want to learn to sample. So what does it mean? So we have here three scenarios. We have a classification problem. We have a registration problem. We have a reconstruction problem. And in each case, you get a point out this as an, as an input. And what you would like to do is subsample it uh, to reduce computational cost. Um, and the key idea is that you want to learn a sampling network. Uh, let's call it sample net. And the sample net will learn the points that are most relevant to the downstream task. So in case of uh, classification, it would be the red points here. In case of registration, you will run sample net twice on each uh, model and get the relevant points that are best suited for registration. If you want to do geometric construction, it would be a different set of points. So really the goal of this uh, talk is to develop the, the intuition and the tools for doing sample net for sampling points. So just to uh, illustrate the advantages of uh, using learned versus non-learned sampling techniques, here is an example. Say you have a point cloud and you're uh, uh, trying to reconstru reconstruct it uh, from the complete uh, point cloud using some sort of autoencoder. This is what you might hope to achieve. Um, if you're using a uniform sampling, and I'll discuss it in a minute, then this is the result that you can achieve. And you will see that the wheels are not perfectly reconstructed. The back of the vehicle is not perfectly reconstructed. So you get the rough shape, but you lose a lot of the details. However, if you're doing learned sampling, you'll get a result like this, which is very similar to the original thing that you have here, OK? So the first thing to ask is, well, why do sampling? What's the difference between sampling and autoencoders? Clearly, you can take your point cloud, pass it through an autoencoder, and then uh, decode it at the other end. And I think there are three reasons uh, you would like to do sampling versus autoencoder. The first one is you want to retain the data structure. So when you have a pipeline, a full stack, um, different components expect data to arrive at a specific uh, a, a specific uh, data structure. So if you have a model that assumes a, a, a point cloud arriving, then it would be ideal to keep that uh, data structure and just uh, subsample it, uh, but not change completely the data structure 
data structure to some other uh, representation that might not be conducive to future downstream tasks. Another thing sorry, which sorry is- Sorry to interrupt. There is a question about the definition of the term registration. This yeah. is a question from the audience, if you could elaborate on it for- Yeah, I'll, I'll talk more about it uh, uh, later. So uh, the question is, as, uh, the goal is as follows. So suppose you have two point clouds and you would like to register them. And because of computational costs, you don't want to use this model of uh, 1,024 uh, points each. So you would like to do registration with much less points. And the question is, how do you choose the points so as to support registration uh, to the best uh, of your ability? So that's the goal of registration. Does it answer the question? So I guess probably, I, if I may just clarify, so registration is basically an ability to align the two models, right? Because right now right. they are sort of observed from different poses. So you need right. to have some points in order to be able to align that. Does right. that help um, the notion yeah, so, of registration? So instead of registration, you might say alignment. Alignment. Um, yeah, and, and I think taking a step back, it, it's just a, an example of a downstream task. So every time you have a bunch of points and you want to subsample them, you should ask yourself, why do I want to subsample them? What is the downstream task that awaits this new data uh, and optimize the sampling for that task? I think that's the message I want to drive uh, in this talk. Is this helpful, Benjamin, or...? No. So imagine the, if you have, I, I cannot unmute you, unfortunately. So do, could we unmute Benjamin so he can ask uh, the question? Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, don't you need to, can you go to the prior slide? Sorry. Um, so it seems to me that classification is independent from registration, right? How can you, how can you match two clouds if you haven't classified them? Uh, so, yeah, so what I'm saying is I'm not using the same sampling technique for all different downstream tasks, but when I have a particular task and I want to uh, subsample it, then I want to train a sample net network that will allow me to do the downstream task. So if the task is, for instance, registration, and I have these two large point clouds, I want to reduce the number of samples. You see only the green points here and the blue points here, and then plug them into the registration algorithm that will take, instead of 1,000 points, only 20 or 30 points, and still be able to report the correct alignment parameters, the rotation translation. I, I understand the task, but how do you know that you should combine these two point clouds? Don't you need to classify them first? So I'm not building, okay, so I'm not building an autonomous vehicle. You know, what I'm building is a tool. And I'm telling you that you have a tool that allows you to subsample points. Now, what is the downstream task is up to you. One might be interested in classification, another in registration, the third one in geometric reconstruction. I show down the line the retrieval problem. It doesn't, I don't care, or the goal of this talk is not to show how to solve registration per se, whereas, to say, well, if you want to subsample the number of points that you have for a particular task, there is a better way than just blindly sampling the points. So okay. I assume that somebody gave me two point clouds and asked me to, uh, to help him register. That, that's the goal. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Are we still on? I think I had a power voltage. Yeah, okay. So um, going back to sampling versus autoencoders, um, there are a couple of reasons you would prefer sampling to autoencoder. The first one is you want to retain the data structure. The, se the second one is you want to preserve fidelity. So what do I mean by that? When you're doing an autoencoder and you reconstruct the 3D point cloud, it's not exactly the 3D point cloud. It's near the, the original uh, data points. And this difference might be important to you. So in some cases, and specifically in, in mission critical cases like uh, autonomous vehicles, you want to know that if the laser told you that the distance to the vehicle is 27.52 meters, you want to preserve that value. So you want to preserve fidelity. And the last thing, I think it's very helpful to have an interpretable uh, data representation that you understand what's going on instead of moving to this obscure latent space. So for all these reasons, 
and I'll show, I'll touch upon some others later, you want to do something versus open products. Okay, so when you open uh, most, I, I shouldn't say most, but when you open many uh, our papers that deal with point clouds, uh, you'll see that the uh, subsample is using something known as furthest point sampling, and the idea is fairly simple. You start with a point, and then you sample the point furthest from the point you already sampled, and so on and so forth. And in this example, out of all the blue points, you sampled four green, uh, green points that best represent uh, the circle, right? And what we want to do is we want to learn how to do that. So hence the title, learning to sample. And the technical challenge is that sampling is not differentiable, which uh, makes it impossible to run it through a neural net and do backprop. And so the way we solve the problem is by cheating. And let me first show you how we cheat and later I'll, I'll, fix, I'll, I'll fix that. So the, the first approach we do, uh, we take is uh, something we call simplify and match and it's a two-step approach. Uh, you start with a simplifying uh, uh, point cloud. So you take this point cloud uh, that uh, builds the letter A. You run it through your network as net. I'll, I'll explain how you train it in a minute. And you get a point cloud that is somehow relatively what you hope, but it's not the actual points on the point cloud. They are in the vicinity in the ambient space. Then at inference time, when you get a new shape that you need to subsample, you, you run it through S net. And then you do a matching step. So you get this red point cloud that live in ambient space. And then you do a, a post-processing sampling step that uh, matches this red point to the blue one and this red one to the blue one. And then you get your subsampled set of uh, the uh, shape B that you wanted to subsample. Okay. Was there any question? Not yet. So how do we do the training? So we assume we have a task network that is fixed and that we want to subsample for it. So it might be registration, it might be classification. Let's keep classification in mind. It's, it's easier to uh, understand the slide. And we're going to fix it. And what we want to do is we want to build a, or train a network called SNET that will produce a subsample of the points uh, that are ideal for the task network to uh, perform its tasks. So for, in for instance, we want to subsample a set of points that the task network will be able to classify. So that would be the task loss classification. And what we will do is we'll uh, define a, a simplify loss uh, on, on, uh, on SNET. And the objective of the entire thing would be to minimize the simplify loss and the task loss uh, combined. So what is the simplify loss? How is it defined? It consists of two terms. The first term uh, tries to spread the red dots uh, over the uh, shape such that each red dot will be next to a blue uh, dot, keeping in mind that eventually we want to do matching because we want uh, to do sampling and not uh, take points in ambient space that are not exactly at the right location. The second term we want uh, is uh, to spread the red dots such that the overall distance of all the blue points from the red dots is minimized. So you can think of a chamfer distance for that matter. So combining this loss, this loss and the uh, task network loss that uh, I mentioned before gives us the objective function that we're minimizing. What happens at inference time? So after we've trained SNET, we get B, the new shape that we need to uh, classify. And we run SNET. Uh, we get a subset of the points. And we do the matching as a post-processing step. And then we get sample points on the shape B. So these point, points are actual points on the shape B. And th these are the points we pass through to the uh, task network. And we get the evaluation that we want. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Um, and it works. Um, so what you see here is a graph comparing a random furthest point sampling in SNET. And the x-axis is the sampling ratio. So this means that we don't sample the point. This means we take every second point, every fourth point, and so on and so forth. And this is the classification accuracy. And we're using a standard uh, data set called ModelNet that consists of 40 classes. There are several thousand uh, shapes there. And what you can see uh, clearly is that 
If you take a sampling rate of 32, so out of 1,024 points, you sample every 32 point, there is a performance gap of 34% between uh, furthest point sampling, which is kind of the blindly sampling the point set, and actually using SNAP. So learning to sample helps you get squeeze more out of the data that you already have. Now, in this case, what we did is we fixed, we're using a standard uh, architecture for point uh, cloud handling called PointNet. In this case, we simply fixed PointNet and we uh, fed it the 32 uh, points that we have here. And this is the result that we get. Uh, alternatively, you can retrain PointNet with the points sampled by the algorithm. And here we show comparison of what happens if you're sampling points using furthest point sampling versus SNET. And we sample, let's say, uh, 32 points, and then we retrain uh, PointNet using either the 32 points generated by furthest point sampling or by SNET. And you see that consistently you get better results using SNET. So it really helps you squeeze more out of your uh, system. And that's something that uh, probably we, we all want to have. Um, so let's look at a particular uh, um, point on this graph, let's say you want to sample just 16 points out, out of the 1,024 points. And you'll see that if you're using SNET, you get an accuracy of 85.6 versus 76.7 in, in FPS. And let's look at the time and space trade-offs that one must make in order to achieve this. So if you're using point net on 1,024 points, uh, the number of parameters is 3.5 million uh, parameters. But because you have 1,024 points, the number of uh, flops is 440 million. If you're using just 16 points, the number of parameters does not change because if you look at the architecture of point net, it's shared across all points. So it doesn't matter how many points you have. And you have a total of just 7 million. The cost of running SNET on uh, uh, 16, meaning that it takes uh, 1,024 points and, and, and subsamples it to 16 points is uh, 0 0.18 million uh, parameters and the flops is 35 million. And the bottom line is that this is the price you pay in order to get just 16 points you uh, reduce the, inf the inference time by 90%, you increase memory space by 5%, and you lost maybe three points in your accuracy. So there is a nice trade-off to, to be achieved here. Uh, another issue that you can use uh, SNET for is scalability. So what happens if you don't want to train your network, uh, the task network on a very large uh, data set? So again, you can use SNET uh, to do that. And the basic idea is as follows. Uh, let's say you have a large point cloud um, and you don't want to train your task network on a large, you don't have the resources to, to run it on a thousand point, uh, point cloud, you want to run it on a much smaller point cloud. So there is an algorithm that we devised to handle this. Uh, you start with the large point cloud, you run standard FPS for the point, uh, sampling and you train your task network. So the task network was not trained on the large point cloud, but on a fairly small one. And if you look, uh, we looked at the uh, quality of uh, results that you get, you get something like 82% accuracy. Now what you can do is you fix the, the task network that was trained on a, on a small point cloud, and then you train SNET on this small point cloud. And then you flip the, the roles. And instead of having a fixed task network and training SNET, you flip the roles and you fix SNET and you retrain the, the task network on a smaller uh, point cloud. Uh, long story short, instead of training your network on 1,024 points, you need to separately train uh, small networks on uh, 32 point clouds only. And the bottom line is that you get an accuracy of 86 compared to the accuracy of 89 that you would have get, uh, gotten if you used the entire data set. So here is another way that you can use SNET instead of uh, training your task network on huge data sets that you don't have the resources to deal with, you can use SNET in order to cleverly downsample it and squeeze as much information as you can from the uh, data that you have.
Um, and this leads me to the next problem that uh, we encountered. Uh, how do you choose the sampling ratio? So this is the slide I've shown you before. Uh, this is the sampling ratio and this is the accuracy. And for some tasks, you might be interested in uh, uh, eight, uh, one to eight sampling ratio. And in another, you might be interested in the one in every 32 point sampling ratio. And notice that in this scenario, you must determine the sampling ratio at training stage. Okay, but this is not ideal. So what we did is we came up with a, a new version called progressive net. And what progressive net does, it treats sampling as an ordering process. So essentially, instead of just telling you which are the the six best points for the task, it orders all the points in the point cloud according to their relevance and importance to the task at hand. So if you need a high accuracy, then you'll uh, transmit uh, as many points as there are in this uh, shape A, or you might just send the, the first four points and the server will say, that's enough. I've managed to classify the shape and I don't need any additional information. And the way you achieve progressive net is essentially by stacking together multiple S nets such that the first one is able to choose uh, the first three points out of all the points. The second one should choose the uh, next three points out of all the points, except for the three, the first three one and so on and so forth. And then you at training time build this network and you get a, a single progressive net network that does the ordering for you. And it works. Um, here is an example comparing uh, further point sampling, S net and progressive net. And you see that progressive net, the orange line, is uh, consistently above the S net, except for the points where S net was trained. And we we'll later, I, I later show that this can be improved as well. So now we have a machinery that allows you not only to sample points according to the task, the downstream task, it also orders the points and allows you to progressively transmit these points to the downstream task. And this is something, for example, that is not clear to me how you would do with an autoencoder, for example. Okay, so it's a nice, uh, um, a, a nice addition to the SNET uh, component. Okay, so um, as I told you at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we were cheating and we were uh, simplifying point clouds instead of actually sampling. If you recall at the beginning, I told you that we train SNET such that given a point cloud B, it will generate a point cloud in ambient space that roughly corresponds to what you would like to have, but then you need to do a post-processing matching step in order to get the sample points. So in essence, we're leaving money on the table. This is not optimized for in the network and therefore you don't gain uh, all the benefits that you would hope to gain. And the way to solve this is using a, a soft projection. I essentially want to replace the argmax operator with a soft argmax. And the idea is as follows. So uh, you have this uh, simplified point Q that uh, you have uh, that roughly falls next to this uh, uh, input point over here, okay? And what you're doing now is you're switching representation. Instead of representing the point Q in the ambient space X, Y, Z coordinate, you represent it as a weighted sum of the uh, points in the neighborhood. So formally, you have a way that is a function of the distance of each uh, point, blue point to the red one, and you normalize it uh, like so, and R is the weighted average of all these points. And you have a temperature parameter that you can train for that determines uh, the temperature of the system. I, I'll touch upon it in, in a second. And during optimization, as you drive T, the temperature to zero, essentially what happens is that instead of having a weighted average of these points, this converges to selecting one of the blue points. So within the optimization, the backprop uh, optimization of the network, we cool the temperature T to zero, and essentially we push the red point to select one of the blue points. So we get the, the selection, the sampling process within the network and not as a post-processing step. And a couple of things to say about it. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it turns regression into classification. So we no longer are interested in a point Q that is roughly at the right location. The point Q now, instead of doing regression, needs to choose 
which one of these points should represent it uh, as the sample point. And in order to achieve this, the weights W are essentially a probability distribution function of uh, which point of the blue points is best uh, suited to represent uh, the point Q. And R is the expectation of all the, the blue points. The nice thing is that R, because it's a weighted average, it must lie on the underlying surface. So by definition, you get a constraint on where the point uh, must lie. And eventually, when you cool t to zero, you essentially get something, you approach something at the, at the limit. OK, and so we've tried it. And this graph shows the benefits of, of doing it. It's the same uh, axis as before on the same data set. And the new uh, graph here is the purple one here that comes from sample net as opposed to SNET. So, um, you see that if you're doing very little sampling, one out of two, there is no difference between the different methods. And if you're doing uh, 128 uh, sampling ratio, then all methods collapse. So there is kind of a sweet spot over here. And if you're going from a uh, furthest point sampling to SNET, you get 34% improvement. And if you're doing sample net that encodes the sampling into the process, uh, end to end, then you gain another 20% improvement. So sample net is the way to go. Um, and the same uh, arguments that uh, I, I mentioned before in terms of memory and computation apply here. Uh, so this axis is the computation reduction. This is the memory increasing percentage. And if the overall system performs at 88.4% accuracy, you can drive down the uh, computational cost by 90% and increase memory consumption by only 6% and get a drop of about 6%. And you're free to choose any point along this line, it depends on what you want to achieve. Okay, and the same thing applies uh, with progressive sampling. Instead of doing progressive net on uh, SNET, you do progressive net on sample net and you get uh, an improvement in performance as you would expect. Another nice thing that you can do is point, point cloud retrieval. So here is an example uh, showing what uh, I mean by that. So if you have a query point and you pass it through the uh, point net algorithm, you take the next to last uh, layer as a descriptor for the shape and do a, a shape retrieval from a database. These are the five top uh, matches that you'll get if you're using an SNET algorithm sample net will give you slightly better results. And this is the result that you get if you're using FPS for this point sampling. And you see that you get much better results if you're using SNET. So again, before I was talking about classification, now I'm talking about retrieval. And again, we have the graphs to show that uh, you get better results. So if you look at the area under the curve, this is a, a precision recall uh, uh, plot. And you'll see that if you're using all 1,024 uh, points and you do the retrieval task, the area under the curve is 0 0.68. If you're using furthest point sampling is 0 0.37. If you're using sample net, you're, you're getting very close to the original data set. You're using only 32 instead of 1,024 points and you get an area under the curve of 0 0.64. Okay, so here is another task that you can benefit from doing a sample. Uh, moving uh, on to the registration or alignment task. So what we did here, we took a, a off the shelf uh, state of the art uh, from last year PCR net. And what PCR net does, it uh, uses point net, uh, point net to do a shared encoders to estimate the transformation. And we simply plug the sample net as a step before them. Uh, and we want, wanted to see how accurate the performance is uh, going to be. So here is a visualization of what's going on. We have here two shapes. And just for the sake of visualization, we are drawing one shape as solid and the second shape as a point cloud. But in reality, both, both shapes are represented as point cloud. And this is the initial guess that you have between the for the two shapes. And then we want to run PCR net uh, in order to align the two uh, point clouds. And we don't want to use the entire uh, uh, 
1024 points, we want to use a subset. And one approach is to use FPS to independently subsample each point cloud. And this is the result that you get. Uh, the final uh, alignment between the two point clouds. I'm showing you here only the point sampled on one uh, shape just for better visibility. In practice, we sample both on the point cloud and the uh, solid uh, object. And this is the result that you get on sample. So uh, I'll point the obvious. You see that the legs don't perfectly match here, but perfectly match over here. And similarly in these two examples. So. Overall, SampleNet helps you get better uh, alignment results using fewer points. And again, you, if you look at the graphs, uh, the x-axis is the sampling ratio, and the y-axis is the mean rotation error. Um, you'll see that we're doing way better than uh, uh, for this point sampling. Random, of course, works uh, extremely uh, bad. So this is yet another example of uh, using a, a sample net to solve a downstream task. And in each, it should come as no surprise, but still um, it, using sample net to learn how to sample simply helps you squeeze more information out of your data, which I think is something useful. Uh, the last uh, downstream task I'd like to show is reconstruction. Um, we're using uh, the point total encoder of uh, Aphelioptos. Uh, from 2017, and in this case, we're not using model net, we're using shape net. Uh, and the goal here is to subsample the points such that you can reconstruct them again. And here we're showing uh, a couple of examples. Um, this is the complete uh, reconstruction using the complete uh, point cloud, using a point sample using sample net, S net, and FPS. And I just point out a couple of uh, cases in S net you get holes in the back of the chair, whereas in sample net you get a much nicer result. Um, in the case of FPS, uh, the legs are kind of crooked in the chair and you get much nicer sampling when you're using sample net. And the last case, when you're doing um, a compare sample net to S net, you notice that the wheels are better preserved in sample net versus S net, okay? And we have graphs to show that this works better as well. Okay, uh, so I, I'll, I'll skip that. I just mentioned one future uh, or present uh, research direction that we're pursuing and adversarial simplification versus adversarial sampling. So what you see here would appear to be a plane, an airplane. Um, and it was produced using SNET but uh, in fact, what we wanted to uh, uh, reconstruct is a car. So an airplane and a car. And the way we did this is as follows. If you recall in SNET, uh, what you want to do is you take an input shape like so, and you pass it through SNET, and you want to reconstruct the airplane back. Okay, that would be the reconstruction task. But what happens if instead of uh, uh, giving an airplane as the output, you give a car? as an output. So what the SNET will do then in simplification, not in uh, sampling, it, it will reconstruct, it will build a point cloud like, like so that kind of is in between uh, an airplane and the car and this might uh, deceive people. So it, you can think of it as an adversarial example. Turns out that if you're doing it with sampling, okay, if you're doing it with sampling, uh, you get, a very uh, noisy result, you can't reconstruct the car and therefore sampling might save you from uh, 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 simplification. Uh, this is an avenue that we're currently uh, actively pursuing, being able to create adversarial, geometric adversarial examples. Okay, I think uh, right on time, I want to summarize. Um, this is the slide I hope you'll take from this talk. Essentially, um, don't blindly sample the point cloud that you have. Uh, sample it according to the downstream task that you want to uh, uh, perform. And the algorithms that we presented show you how to uh, learn to sample, how to um, use differentiable relaxation to achieve that, uh, that it outperforms task agnostic sampling. And the nice uh, extension is that you can do progressive net, so you can order all the points. Uh, looking into the future, two obvious things to, to look at. One is uh, do it temporally. So 
how do you do it sequentially in a video or over time? And that's one axis. The other axis, I wonder if you can push it down the leader itself. So the leader keeps generating more and more points, but maybe it doesn't have to generate so many points. Maybe if your goal is just to build a classification oriented leader, maybe you can get by with a very simple and cheap leader that generates much less points. So the sampling will be done offline. It will dictate the way the leader operates and you can use cheaper materials to achieve this task. And I think that's kind of a, an exciting and interesting uh, avenue for, for future research. Uh, code and papers are uh, publicly available. Uh, any questions, please direct to my students because I don't know how to run the code. And thank you very much.